So this is uh, uh, my talk, uh, Bayesian partial linear model for skewed longitudinal data. And these are my quarter. So uh, this is uh, my student, uh, one on time, and uh, uh, she's not in Florida State anymore. Of course, she graduated. She has done the most of the heavy lifting. Of course, you know, that's a good thing to have uh, you know, students. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this is uh, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Pathy, you know, and uh, Stuart Lipsis from Harvard, and Dr. Lipsis, who's uh, actually data sort of motivated uh, some of the things which we have done. Okay, so uh, this is the plan. Uh, so I'll give the introductions. I'll talk about what we mean by partial linear model. In the introduction, I will talk about what kind of data we are uh, we are dealing with. And um, you know the data examples, and then uh, uh, this is a little bit about posterior consistency, which is the theoretical part. And I will go very briefly over it, you know, just to say that you know why it is needed, uh, and maybe what are the major results. And then we'll do the uh, uh, the data analysis. Uh, actually, after data, uh, here should be data analysis, and then we'll talk about simulation studies and the discussion. Okay. Uh, Okay, so what is a uh, longitudinal data and what kind of longitudinal data we are talking about? So here we are dealing with a continuous response, but we measure them uh, over time, repeated observations within the same subject, and you have multiple subjects. And uh, the main feature of this, data, this kind of uh, data set of this kind of um, uh, problem is that we have possibly irregular observation times. So it's not regularly, you know, not everybody is observed at the same time period at the same time and may not have the same number of observations either. Okay? And we have covariates, categorical and continuous, and uh, the uh, goal is to find the effects of time and covariate. But uh, so if you look at the data structure, you know you have the subjects and IDs and then you have a response at time, you know, this is the time point and this is the covariate. So maybe this subject has been measured three times, then now the subject probably will be measured a couple of times. Things like that. Now, of course, yeah. If, if every subject, uh, you know, the main thing uh, uh, idea about how to more analyze these things depends on what kind of structure you have. So, if you for every subject, if you observe them for a really long uh, time period, and if you observe them uh, too many times, I mean, when I, when I say the many times, the more it's a little bit subjective, but but then maybe you, you need to look at more like a dynamic modeling and you are moving the time series kind of setting. But we are talking about when the number of, you know, the time period is moderate but not very long and, and you are observing many, you know, most of them at a moderate number of times. You know, that's the kind of model we are trying to, uh, that's the kind of situation we are trying to handle here. Okay. So, uh, uh, and your major interest is to find out the effect of the covariance, okay? And so the effect of time, you know, how it changes over time is sort of like you need to model them good so that you can find the effect of the covariance, but that's not your main goal, okay? So that's what, you, you know, that's the difference with, well, you know, the Dan's ideas is more about, you are trying to see how it changes over time. You almost want to predict that pattern, okay? So uh, that's the major, Difference. So, uh, to give you an idea, this is the data example which uh, motivated our study. It's a P2C2 study. This is, uh, they are looking at cardiac abnormalities of children uh, of the HIV uh, mother. Uh, and uh, 432 children, uh, of course, they have HIV status at birth. Uh, one is yes and zero is no. That's the major covariate. And uh, we want to see what is the effect of that on the cardiac abnormalities. So, they were treated. Uh, with uh, an um, antiviral uh, drug, which actually has uh, basically, it, it's a very effective drug for um, for HIV, but uh, and preventing uh, people uh, getting uh, these children getting the HIV, their HIV negative, but um, it damages the uh, heart. So that so they are looking at over time, um, you know, um, how, how much the damage is done. And the way they look at it, they measure these things, which is RBO, which is measured via EKGs, and it measures the, the, the heart wall, thickness of the heart wall. So, and um, it's very unbalanced design. 56 people have only one visit, so they're, uh, they're measured only once, and they're 
to uh, 16 uh, people who have almost uh, 16 visits. So you can see that how variable the number of observations per uh, subject is. So this is not a very ideal situation to do a dynamic model. That's what I'm trying to get at it, just to differ to you. So, um, uh, so this is the one we're doing here. And we all, uh, it is known, uh, I mean, there is a biological reason behind it, and, and you can see it on, later in the data. This RBO, which is the major response, it is highly skewed. It is so skewed that you, you cannot even take a log transformation and make it symmetric or something like that. Okay, but it has a unit model, but it's highly, highly skewed. And um, the median is this, and the median. So, uh, what, if you have a, a skewed uh, response, highly skewed response, what you can do, in general, people say that you can use a transformation, but it's, kind of, it's well known, of course, that the problem there is that if you do a transformation, you know, when you transform it back to the original one to interpret it, it's kind of difficult to interpret because your model is based on a transformed data. Then, you know, to get back what is happening in real life, you, know, you have to get it back. And there's not, a, not necessarily a very easy one-to-one -one correspondence. Okay, so interpretation is the bigger problem. Another thing is that if you're Bayesian, then if you have a transformed model, you know, you, you sort of have to uh, put your prior opinions on it. So it's difficult to elicit prior opinions because uh, uh, the clinicians or your, you know, those people, they can give very good prior opinions about, um, you know, the location of the, res you know, the major location of the response. Uh, but uh, if you tell them that, okay, I have a transformation and the transformation is unknown, uh, you know, like something to the power, um, you know, if it's a log transformation, then it's probably still okay. Then, but otherwise, any other complicated transformation, they can't give the prior opinions uh, about uh, transform data very well. Okay, so it's kind of hard for them to do. So we, we, we try to see something where this elicitation would be easy to do. So, uh, so model, you know, typical model, uh, you know, this is just a little bit of review of the existing work. So you look at the at the i subject at the uh, at the time point t i j, and this is how the many of the models looks like. This is the covariant effect. This is the effect of time. Okay, and this is generally as a function. That's the partial linear model idea. Okay, that this part, this thing is a function, some unknown function, and this thing is parametric. Okay, and and then there's a error structure. So you can do typical uh, people do is that they do mean regression. So they assume that expectation of EIJ is uh, zero. So this is the mean, and they try to do a regression about it. Okay, and uh, they have done parametric. Uh, and this uh, function of time is parametric. And uh, you know the simplest thing to do is to do multivariate normal, and then they can do the otherwise they can do the random efforts. And uh, typically you can do WLS, and you can see. Any longitudinal data analysis book you can check, and these are the methods you, you know you, you, you have seen. Now, uh, the problem with the uh, random effects is this: yeah, it's, it's very effective depending on certain situations. But uh, the if you the random effects model, the major problem is that if you go, um, you know, if you have an association structure from time to time, where the, the association doesn't you know, between the two time points doesn't change much as the interval goes up, then random effect models are really, really good. Or if you have a regular observation field. Or anything beyond that, you know, you start, your random effect structure, structure starts becoming very complicated. And then what happens is that you have too many parameters in it. So computation has become hard. Another thing is that you will later see that we are dealing, if you have a mean regression, then it is fine. But if you have a, any other things, you have a skewed data, that depending on what kind of distributions you put it on the random effect, the random effect models becomes, uh, you know, like marginal structure, it gets destroyed. So it's very difficult to interpret when you try to look at the effect of covariance. So, because you want to try to look at the effect of the covariance, you know, here, this is the random error, this is the random effect, you sort of have to integrate these things out. So once you integrate it out, the interpretation may be difficult. You know, unless you have very strong assumptions on the distribution of W1. Okay. So we are not going to, what I'm trying to say that we are not going to take the part of the random effects modeling here because this is, uh, is the, the, you know, this is not an appropriate data set for it. Or it's not an appropriate example for it. So, um, uh, okay. Uh, 
So if, if this ERJ, this, uh, this is, I don't think about mean regression. Mean regression is very appropriate uh, when you have, um, you know, uh, when you don't have symmetry, or when you have symmetry. But if you things are not approximately symmetric or something, it's a high skew, I mean, it's not a very appropriate uh, measure of the location. Mean is not a very appropriate measure of location. So, in, so this is case, ours is highly skewed, so it's not a very good thing to do. For, you know, it's not very um, helpful. So, uh, of course, you can do median regression. So, uh, in median regression, so what you assume is that probability of in the EIG, the error, you know, it's, um, it's just, uh, has the median is zero, okay? So, you can, you can have, uh, many people have worked on it, that they have working assumption of independence, and some people, you know, there's a weighted residuals method by Chang, and he has a couple of papers. Huggins with some of his um, um, co-authors has, has used robust likelihood. So, uh, and they have dealt with parametric HD, uh, the hazard, uh, this uh, function of time is parametric, and uh, they have, of course, the feature, which is the overhead effect, which is parametric too. So, uh, so this is a, this is a shortcomings I believe. And another thing is that even though they say robust not likely, but actually there is no likelihood. You know, it's sort of uh, it's, you, you are really not giving a distribution of the responses. So we can't use it for predictions. You can't do very uh, good about model evaluations. You know, there are a few things you are missing here. Okay. The other problem is that of course you can't deal with parametric, uh, non-parametric uh, function of time. So these are the major shortcomings of this, of this time. So there's a paper by um, M estimator method by Hay et al. and JASA 2002. They actually deal with partial linear model. So what they have, they have a non-parametric function of time and the parametric beta. And they have an unspecified ERG. So the basic idea here is that you look at this objective functions. Rho is a function, uh, it's a function. If you take rho equal to r squared, then you have, you have a least squared style. If you take rho equal to absolute value, then uh, it is a least absolute deviations. And that's the basic idea. But even there, you know, there's no real likelihood there. You know, it's sort of like a robust method. Um, um, you can't do predictions and other things. Uh, but, uh, but they can deal with um, um, non-parametric HD. And of course, the, when you lose not only predictions, you lose, lose in terms of Precision. We'll show it later. That how much you lose by doing this kind of method compared to when you do uh, a likelihood-based, uh, full-based procedure. Okay. So um, again, I'm just going over it very quickly. Um, just uh, mean regressions is not really a good thing to do for if you have a skewed response like our case, RBO. So partial linear model for median. There are very few words. And the major thing about partial linear model, you go in here, uh, then uh, a partial linear model that you have a non-parametric function of time and you have a parametric covariate effect. So they are very appealing in terms of uh, interpretation. Okay, you have a, there's a lack of lighting in the base method for skewed response. And many, and another thing you're trying to see is that not only give a lighting in the or base method, you want to give some a method which has a theoretical justification. So I'll come to that later. Like what do you think by theoretical justification and why is it needed, okay? So, uh, uh, well, the main theoretical justification is that that semi-parametric based asymptotics, you know, you, I know that it has been developed quite a bit, so there's a consistency results for semi-parametric based asymptotics for invariant regression, like party Johnson, say, for example, but they look at mean regressions and symmetric error. Then there is a paper by Pelanis, it hasn't been published yet, but it's, it's available. You know, the preprint. Uh, then they do also mean regressions. They have a skewed error, but they're still doing mean regression. So, of course, here we're trying to see that trying to develop something. We'll try to develop patients as uh, asymptotic, where not only we have skewed error, but we are going to do median regressions. So that's the major new thing. So uh, that's what. And none of these things actually deal with multivariate response or longitudinal response. Either. That's, that's a type of multivariate response. And of course, partial linear model, none of them has this. So that's, those are the things which are missing. So trying to just give you an idea about what are the things missing so that you can get an idea about what we, what we need to do. So our goals are heavily skewed response to focus on medium, non-parametric HD, 
you know, diametric effect of HIV status, a lagging based analysis because it has a better efficiency and prediction, uh, and it can do predictions, and within subject association. That's another thing we haven't talk, talked about. So, the within subject associations uh, and the distributions, we want to put it so the structure is very flexible, you know, which is very much needed for longitudinal data. That means uh, it can deal, uh, generally we have a quite a bit of prior opinion, a quite a bit of uh, information, or, or actually the focus is mainly on looking at um, marginally what is the effect at, at a particular time point, what is the effect of COVID at a particular time point. So we, we want to preserve a very nice model for that, but we want to make sure the association structure is flexible, that means it can fit various types of data. That, that, that would be one of the things we look at. So this is the model, which is very similar to the previous ones. It's only the details there, different. So again, this is the response. This is the covariate effect. So for our case, it is the HIV standards, once in zero, pretty easy. Effect of time, and this is the error structure. Okay. So and I is for uh, subject, and J is for the time point. So TIJ, keep in mind, they don't they don't have to be equal for every subject. Okay. So our uh, assumption is that the error distribution FE, if this is skewed marginal density. So marginally, they have to be, it has to be skewed. That's it. So, um, but it is said, uh, its median is at zero. That's the basic idea. Its median is at zero. So marginally, this is the median. Xij, this is the median of yij. Margin at every number of points. So okay, that's what you are trying to get. So now, uh, how do you model this? So uh, we actually assume that this is a, um, uh, a continuous function. Okay, it's bounded continuous function. Okay, but what? Of course, what you do is that we approximate this by using B spline. Now we can use other techniques. Okay, it's not. You don't have to use B spline. We have to do that because it's easy to implement within, um, um, you know, box and within these things. But, and it's pretty flexible. But I, I want to emphasize: I'm not assuming, I'm not assuming that it is, it's, it's a this point. I'm just, I'm, I'm giving this, you need to keep this in mind. We're approximating it. So um, you, you have the knots, the one between PN, which are checking to be quantiles, and the BT is this. And so the assumption is that approximately it is this. So median Mij is approximately this, okay? But it's not exact, okay? So we have to we will show it later that why that is important, I and mean, that that's the theory we'll come later. So uh, the, about the error distribution, okay? So our assumption is that it's a skewed error distribution. This class of distributions are called split densities. So. Think about F stars, suppose it is a symmetric, unimodal symmetric density. So what you're telling is that we are just in the negative uh, uh, support and on the positive support, we are just using two different scales for it. Okay? So we are changing the scale for the negative support. So if, uh, so if lambda is 1, then this thing is uh, symmetric, unimodal. But if lambda is not 1, they are not symmetric. Okay? So it becomes left skewed. And, but uh, what it does, because uh, it, make, it preserves this property, that the median will be still zero. Median of Fe will be still zero. So to give you an idea, if it is a double, say for example your H star is uh, double exponential, then this is how it looks like. That's what is called a split uh, density, because it, there's a split here at zero. This is how it looks like, you know, if it is a double exponential H star. Okay, so that's an assumption. So this is, of course, you can see that there's a discontinuity here. So your theory has to sort of deal with that. And, but uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's actually a pretty big class of uh, distributions. Of course, this, this, this is the only special case, okay, when it's double exponential. It, it, we are not assuming that our F star is double exponential. So it could have any shape, but it would be always similar. Uh, it would be always in the model. Okay, so that's the assumption. Then uh, about the association structure, we are using uh, Gaussian copula. We, uh, though the theory is developed for any copula, okay, but we are using Gaussian copula because it is again easiest to uh, uh, deal with. Computationally, 
that is in one of the easiest one to deal with. That's pretty flexible. So the idea is that, you know, don't worry about like how it looks like. You know, the main thing is that what it does is that, you know, if you can come up with a marginal structure, so the advantage in Coppola is that you can have a multivariate distribution which will have that kind of marginal structure. So the advantage is that whatever the marginal structure you think is appropriate, for our case, the marginal structure will be a partial linear model with median at zero, then this thing takes care of the multivariate uh, within a uh, subject association. And it's pretty flexible. Okay? So that's the advantage of Coppola. So, you know, you can write down the lots uh, of data like this, you know, whereas this don't worry about how, you know, it's, it's, it looks a mess, but, but that's okay. It's actually um, not so difficult. So, uh, and sigma i is the within subject association uh, of the copula. Now, uh, keep in mind that this depends on subject. So, we can assume that what it gets there is that we can assume that every sub, you know, not all subjects has the same association structure. We'll show it later. How it, they can have a different association structure. So that's the flexibility of a copula model. Okay. So, uh, so parametric, let's say for example you want to do parametric analysis. It's pretty fairly simple. Let's say for example you have a double exponential f star. Then, you know, remember the density function I've shown before, that kind of structure. Then the only thing you need, you need a prior and gamma and lambda. This is the skewness parameter, and this is the um, uh, the, uh, the parameter associated with the extra. Of course, if it is non parametric, then gamma will be replaced by some kind of prior process of extra. Okay? So you just have to come up with this. But of course, it, is, it may be inappropriate and fairly restrictive in practice. So, what you do, you want to basically get into a situation where this thing is non parametric. Okay? So, how do you do that? So, what we uh, suggest here is this: we look at a, any. We know that any unimodal symmetric density f star can be expressed like this. Uh, there's a type. This would be open interval zero to fifty. This is a reason why fair because it's a density function. Sure, right. So, uh, so we can extend this any split density with a uh, which is uh, unimodal and uh, you know decreasing on both sides. A unimodal can be expressed like is a mixture of skewed uniform, where this is a mixing density, g okay? So you have to come up with this. So instead of specifying f star, now you have to basically specify g theta, or you have to put a prior opinion about g theta. Now, of course, uh, this is sort of like a very complicated structure for a uh, clinician to come up with a prior estimation. So what do you do? So, go to the next one. So, say for example, you want to put a prior on g. So the natural way of putting this prior will be to put a Dirichlet process prior. So what you get is a kernel mixture of Dirichlet. So for the Dirichlet process, you need to come up with a precision and you need to come up with a mean, g naught. So the way I view it, g naught is the prior guess for g. So, but keep in mind, um, clinicians, or, or like in practice, we really don't have any prior opinion about g naught. This is sort of like a very mathematical construct, you know, like all the mixing <coughs> or something. But you may have a prior opinion about, um, you know, about the error distribution or about the response, okay, error distribution of the response. So you have to somehow get this prior guess for G using the prior opinion about, uh, uh, about the response, okay. So um, we will come to that. But if you have this structure, it's very easy to do NCMC implementation. Uh, like you can do Setula multi construction, but this I'm not telling you that is the only way to do it. Actually, it is an approximation. The reason we use Setula multi construction because it's very easy to implement within wind parts. Okay, but of course you can you know you can do exact simulations. It's just harder to uh, implement it. because we wanted to develop something so that we can uh, give it to others to you know use it in practice. So we use this, but. Uh, in MCNC models, but you can use uh, their, their, their exact simulation. You would actually with the drop in the if you then you will see. So, uh, but the question is that how do I come up with the prior guess for G? Keep in mind that I haven't talked about that yet. Okay. So, uh, you have to put a prior beta, alpha t. So, these are the about the functions 
you know, of time, so you can elicit that effect of uh, covariant effect on, on median, you can elicit that very easily. Keep in mind that, you know, <coughs> um, these things, these things is doable. Association structure, you can again elicit that. Okay. The question is that G, prior G, how do you elicit that? Okay. So, what you do is that you use this theorem, which basically connects uh, the G0 with uh, your prior opinion about X star, okay. which is the error distribution. So, let's say, for example, if lambda is equal to, you said the prior guess for lambda is 1. That means we said, you know, initial that. We just guess that it's, it's symmetric. You know, we don't know whether it's left skew or it's right skew. It's symmetric. That's a guess. Then you are all, you can even look at the, your guess about um, if, you know, uh, the error distribution. And from there, you can get back to a genome. Okay. So say, for example, you assume it to be D density. Then you can show that G0 will be inverted beta. So for any parametric uh, guess you have, you can get back to genome. So once you specify the genome, and then you have a precision, you have the whole thing going, okay? So your elicitation is done, okay? So you, just to show that how you, so let's look at the uh, data set actually. So this is uh, the histogram for RBO of HIV zero, but this is not exactly the responses, all responses over time. What you have done that you have taken an uh, improved estimator of the effect of time, the subtracted that all out for HIV group zero and HIV group one, and this is how it looks like. Okay, can you see that it's very, it's very skewed. Not only that, you can see the variance is pretty different for both group. Okay, and um, you can also this plot. This is the plot for HIV group zero, and this is the plot for HIV group one. You can see the variability. You can see the effect of time. This is, of course, lowest matter, which is very good estimate. So what you saw here is basically I subtracted this, this things from these observations, okay? So that you can get an idea about how the error functions looks like, error distribution looks like. So you, you, can, you can look at them, and you can see that variability is okay. You, to look at how the association structure, you can do variable plot. And then you can see this is for one group and this is for another group. This is sort of, of course, they're not perfect, you know, this is a very crude estimator. So, which basically means this here, the association structure is uh, sort of a uniform association. This tells you this association structure grows over time. Don't put too much emphasis on this jump at the, or this fluctuation at the end. You know, there are very few observations there. Okay? So, you have to look at like overall trend. The main thing to uh, learn from here is plots is that the association structure for both groups are different. So that's why, remember the sigma i has to depend on a statement, depend on a subject that comes handy. This is one of the major advantages of popular model that you, it, it gives you the advantage of like having very different association structure for different groups and things like that. So um, if you do the results, so we, we look at parametric methods using and then semi-parametric, and then the M estimators, which is our main major competitor. Okay. Then you can see the, uh, uh, forget about the intercept, that probably not that much important. Look at the effect of HIV. You can see the standard error, 50% less, you know, which almost means like you, you need to increase the um, sample size by how much you need. Uh, almost like you have to double the sample size to get that. Okay. So you can see that how much is the gain in efficiency. That's the major advantage, you know. Uh, generally, an estimator probably will not do such a bad thing about, it will not have too much of a bias in your estimator, but it's not very efficient. That's the major advantage of being in a Bayesian method. Other than that, you can do predictions and model checking which will come to that. We did not give anything about um, other things here, you know. So uh, the main, main thing that, there, there's, a, there's enough data evidence here, based on posterior, posterior evidence, that the skewness and association structure for two HIV groups are different. You know, like you can show that. So, um, now this is uh, sort of um, one way to see whether your model has done, your model, your prediction is good. Um, I should have used color. My student probably should have used color. But, uh, <laughs> You don't see the lines very well. So basically, idea is that this is the median, and this is the 
third quarter and this is the first quarter over time. Okay. So if the model, you know, if your prediction is good, at any any one of this interval, you want 25 percent, 25 percent, 25 percent, 25 percent. That should be okay. If that happens, that means your prediction mechanism, the model fit is really good, which is actually we get. It. We are for both groups, we, we get pretty good, okay? much better than an estimator. Okay? So it basically shows that this is a real, this is fitting the model good. And it's very good because you may not you you may get a very good prediction at a particular time point, but may not do all at, at all of the time point. But it doesn't. We don't do too well for this group at the end, towards the end, but there are very few observations at the end. There are not. We're assuming that the observation times actually don't depend on the responses, which is sort of like a iffy assumption, especially towards the end. So which shows up here. So it, it, it fits up did it really well. Uh, and you can do the predictions like this. So uh, we got two groups have very different error densities, heteroscedasticity. So this is another thing you can you can build in here. Within subject association different for two groups, you can do it. Excellent fit for quadrant quartile functions and more precise estimator for base methods and great prediction for patient methods. You know that's what you, you get. So this is of course this just shows, and of course we did not talk about the prior elicitations, ease of prior elicitations, you know, uh, and of course the implementation is very easy. Uh, we, can, we can actually, our basic program is done in Winbox, you know, and, and that's, that's, I thought it was a major advantage. So, uh, now here comes the theory. So, uh, the idea is that how to come up with a, uh, you know, a good prior, it, like, you know, put a prior, which is good in some sense. So when you say that some prior is good, that means what? It should have a large enough support so that you know it has a flexibility that it can cover all possibilities, and the prior should lead to the posterior consistency. So we have a bunch of uh, notations. Not worry about it. That we use this notation. So this is the class of priors, and we use this phi u g n. What we mean is that that means that f belongs to u. So this is the posterior uh, probability that f. Will, will be inside this set given the data. So DN is for the data. We put N there just to indicate that it's a sample size, it depends on the sample size, because everything has to be put as N goes to infinity. Okay. So um, uh, this is a, this is wrong actually, this integral sign, sorry, this is, should be arch side. So you look at the absolute value of the difference, integral, there's an now, uh, how do you know that two things are close to each other? Because there are three components here. H, the error distributions, F, and then beta. Okay? So each one of them, you have to have an appropriate distances. So for um, error distributions, this is the dis uh, distance we do. Of course, integral of the absolute value has to be the same. And for, uh, or you can do the kulbeck lightning that's another thing. Or, um, Could, could be never, you know, this is, you have your choices about this, so we use one of this. For beta, of course, it is very easy to know what's the distance functions. And for H naught T, we use it, I'll show you what the distance function here. Okay, so uh, our, we, this is a bunch of assumptions, we said that class containing the true density, so split to the model, you know, that's of course, we assume that we are, our, our model, the true, true, is true, true density is within our true model is within our model, within our problem model. Okay, so it has a symmetric new model. There is a uh, row which is in it. So the multivariate, it's, it follows multivariate formula. Then thing you keep in mind that we did assume that uh, it's a split density. So that means it has a discontinuity. True uh, density has a discontinuity. Error density has a discontinuity at zero. Okay, and h dot, we assume it to be bounded continuous. Uh, the main thing, we also assume that a priori, we know the bound. We don't know the type bound about it, but we know some idea, which is not a very unreasonable assumption. You know, like we always know that what is the effect of time, you know, how big it would be at any time point. It's a very reasonable assumption. So that you can put a prior so that it covers that bound. Okay? Like, or it will have a very little. Um, at least it will have a very negligible support outside the bound. Okay. Because it doesn't make sense to 
which had too much prior probability outside the bound. Okay, so you is as this. Uh, don't worry about this. Uh, there's a bunch of blame. So let's um, look at what is the major results. So the major results what we got is this. So if this is say for example, this is the truth where it is, you know, like this is the sale of all models, and this is the true model. You look at a set around it properly defined. What do you mean by set around this? You know, you have to have a proper distance um, ideas. And then uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, probability that the f will belongs to this set uh, given the data, and as the sample size goes to infinity, it goes to one almost sure. Okay, so that's a major result. So that means uh, you, you, whatever, whatever how, however small you want to set uh, your truth, you know, as you get gather more and more data with this kind of uh, structure, you know, the, your posterior probability will constant. Of that set will be will go to one. Okay, so you, now many things you have to keep in mind that when you prove this theorem, this H naught we don't assume it to be um, um, spline actually. We don't assume it to be fine, uh, you know combination of finite spline. We assume it to be any continuous functions which is bounded, and we know that bound. Okay, so it's a very small assumption. Okay, it's, it's very realistic assumption. Okay. Even though we are actually using approximation. Uh, to estimate this. So, of course, the, which I did not talk about very, very precisely, because they are in the uh, paper, that we have to make sure that as um, as we gather more and more data, that we include more and more splines. And there has to be some mechanism about how many uh, splines we need to, like how many basis functions we need to uh, put in. Okay? So as long as you do that, you will get um, Asymptotic results. Okay, so you are you are you are going to learn the truth, and of course uh, this is uh, you uh, you can actually get a pretty uh, consistent result on H estimate on H naught, but only the consistency will only happen at the time point of observations. So it won't happen everywhere. That like you will not know the estimate everywhere, which is realistic because how can you know a function everywhere unless you have observations at those time points? Okay, you only know it only the places where you observe them. Okay? So that's one thing. Unless you have a lot of assumptions, you can't get, you can't know the functions uh, of time everywhere. Okay? So, uh, okay. okay. So we did a simulation study. Now one of the things, the main, one of the major things about the simulation study, we want to know that how it does in terms of mean square error, how it does MIS. If you look at it, it's sort of like a mean square error, but you are looking at the difference between the true and the, of course, for simulation study, this is known, and between the estimate, <coughs> and then you are looking at, at all the time points where you have observation, okay? And um, so, if this is small, that means you are doing good. So, uh, so the first one we did is that uh, where, um, you know, it's, it's, the error distribution is basically normal. Okay. And the XIJ is, those are the covariate which we are generating using this. Now, here, of course, our modeling assumption is correct. Okay, so this here is this multivariate normal. Then the second one we did, which is um, multivariate normal, but the sigma i's are different. So this is uh, when all the sigmas are the same for all subjects. This is different subject. And here you can see that it depends on XIJ. But we're trying to estimate it where we actually don't know the structure. So our estimator we use without using the structure, whereas in reality it is. So we're trying to see if we miss the covariate uh, estimation of the association structure, how much we miss compared to the others. Okay. And the third structure is that when you have a um, lot of um, you know, uh, outliers, 10% you know, of them are pretty heavy outliers. And the fourth one is that when it's the gamma, which is heavily skewed, you can't get any transformations or anything. So this, this distribution is actually, the density class is not within our structure. So we want to see that if there's another type of skewed density, can we do it, still do a good, reasonable job? Okay. So that's our major idea. So you can see, of course, there's no point in telling that we're doing good, unless we compare with the competitors, but that's the basic idea. So we look at the M estimators, and then we look at our method, 
So many things you can see that in MSC. See this? For beta 2, for beta 1, that's true over here. And look at MIS, big game. Okay? That's the first one, which you are supposed to do well. This is the second one, where it's a, a heteroskelastic situation, but we missed it. Okay? Look at Evan here. I think it's pretty clear that how much we do. <coughs> And this is the large outlier case. Even there you can see the, the remarkable gain in the efficiency. And this is the gumbo meter, which is of course is disadvantageous for, extremely disadvantageous for. But even there you can see that uh, there is a, I think there's a fantastic gain in all of this. So which, which actually, which is of course, I'm here pitching to the convert already, but this is just um, you know, it's, it's, which is expected, like the Bayesian methods, you know, we would like to, should have a huge gain in efficiency. Okay. Um, so, so this is the summary of benefits in the partial linear model, class specification is, it is actually easy to implement, and uh, it can allow any valid correlation metrics. Theory is pretty generalized to the Monte Carlo model. Keep in mind, the theory which we, we prove, you can have any kind of popular structure. And, and it will go through, the proof will go through. Okay. And it can handle outliers. We haven't proved any theory for outlier, but at a simulation study show, it can handle outlier. And even if you miss the heteroskedastic structure by any chance, it still, still does a good job. Good job. But you can, if you can get it, they get how the heteroskedastic structure is, then of course you can, you, our method can handle that, which you have seen. Okay. And the MCMC tool, actually, this is another thing I want to um, say great things about our implementation. That it's actually fairly easy, you know, it's not a very difficult thing. You know, we, we are, if you go to our website, the, 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 the PASS program is there, and also there is another one which is implemented in the C++. For which I must admit that what we did is that we took the source code from the box and we just compiled it, which is, I guess, just standard practice. Thank you.